I'm going to go back. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Great to see so many of you here. And I also want to say welcome to the people that are joining us on the live stream. We're going to have a live stream today. Um, we're also going to... I also would encourage people that are watching on the live stream to submit questions if you have any, and then we will try and answer them later on. So tonight is all about AI. Some of you may have been to some AI events recently. How many of you have been to an AI event recently? Good. Great. So you know something about the topic. That's great. Um, also, I think what's important today is we're going to actually not talk about the far future of AI. We're going to talk about what you can do with AI today. Some very practical examples of AI. Um, and also, my microphone is not always working, so <laughs> I'm just going to check. Sorry. Can you still hear me? Great. I can't actually see you very well because of my glasses, they're reflecting, but never mind. Um, so my name is Sonja Lackner and I am the head of advisory here in Stockholm at Futurist in Stockholm. I'm going to tell you uh, very briefly about who we are at Futurist if you haven't heard of us before. So we're a digital innovation consultancy. Uh, we originally come from Finland, not all of us do, but as a company we do. Uh, we have around 550 people in several locations, which you can spot on the map over there. Um, and uh, founded in 2000, and we have roughly 35 nationalities. I'm not even sure if that's true, I think there might be a few more. Um, so uh, you're going to meet some people from Futurist later on. Um, my role here I am the moderator, I am not an AI specialist. I have a very strong interest in AI, but um, that comes actually from my job, but it's not, you know, I'm not a specialist, so don't ask me any specialist questions. Um, but I have a very strong interest in, especially in the human AI relationship. I'm very interested in, in how we humans can cooperate with AI. And also right now I'm fascinated by the big problem of automating warehouses. I don't know if any of you know what the biggest problem with that is. Does anybody know? Why we still need humans in warehouses? Because robots can't grab things the way we can, because it's actually very, very complex. Um, it's more complex than you think. So that's actually, there's a huge race going on, and that's what I'm interested in right now and reading up all the time. Um, just briefly, I'm going to go back to the agenda. So first up, we're going to have uh, Thomas Syrianen, who is the co-founder of uh, Futurist. Uh, he actually used to be a CEO of Futurist and is now the head of AI renewal at Futurist in uh, Finland. And also, so he's going to talk first about four ways to bridge the gap between vision and reality. That's going to be about half an hour. After that, we're going to take one or two questions that are directly related to his talk. We have another talk by Rulof Peters, who is here sitting in the front row, who is also going to talk about, uh, he's the, the founder and CEO of uh, Creative AI. And also, uh, his talk is also going to be around 30 minutes, and we do two questions. And then I'm going to ask a panel up on stage, and we're going to do a discussion and lots of questions and answers. So please prepare your questions during this time. And uh, of course, also, as I said, on the live stream, if there's any questions, just please submit them and we'll look at them and we'll answer those too. So, but now I'm going to hand you over to Thomas for the first speaker of the evening. Good. So let's start talking about how to bridge the gap between vision and, and reality. Um, overall, sort of like, as you know, 
there's a lot of lot of activity ongoing in, in the field of AI. Huge amount of startups, lots of press and so on. And it also quite often it looks like Harry Potter magic, how things are done and what happens. We see all the demos, cool demos out there. And then we hear sort of discussion of what is the potential impact of AI. Unfortunately, the reality is that quite often the realized impact is quite small. Especially when we talk about the product like application or, or adoption of AI, we see quite little impact at the moment. Don't get me wrong, I, I strongly believe that there will be a big impact, but we need to work to make it happen. So what are the sort of the gaps between we go into solving them? So there are a couple of gaps. What makes it difficult to actually make AI applicable and, and realize the, the visions? One is knowledge and understanding of AI broadly. So the way I the way we see and the way I see it quite often that 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 business people, there's a lack of understanding what AI can do. And quite often on the technical side, very technical side, there's a lack of understanding what are the business problems to be solved. And currently the, the gap is so big in many, many places that the dialogue is not even sort of constructive. So we need to make sure that, that we even have a common language in talking about the different opportunities of AI and how to apply it and what are the business problems and how to solve them. So this is one of the topics. Then something that is, is also very common is data. Of course, if we don't have data, we don't have AI. And, and quite often, the sort of the, there are div many, many different aspects of why data is the, is the bottleneck in making AI actually uh, impact. So I will get to, that, get to that. And then there's a third topic. So the first two ones, we can address all ourselves. The third one is something that, that will be solved more and more in the in the near future so so i think that although the situation is reasonably good but still the maturity of the industry and the technologies and the products available to build the solutions there needs to be a big step in maturity and 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 trust me there are the big players like google's Microsoft, and those are actually all working on democratizing ai technologies and and there are some other examples that are, and i will show you a couple of things also in addition to the technology that are required to bridge the gap but the first two ones, the knowledge and the data is something that everybody can do something about it. But then I think that, that there's, there's this kind of broad industry topic to, to fix the tech and, and other maturity issues. One of the challenges still is that, that when we start applying AI, we actually move quite broadly across different abstraction levels. So we start from data. We have then algorithms, we build uh, AI capabilities like, like machine vision or, or predictions and so on. We build applications like chatbots and so on. Then we need to integrate into the workflows and the processes. And then we even need to include them into the whole broad question of what business are we in and so on. And quite easily we end up in these situations where we need to reconfigure a lot of things across either the value chain or across the organizational layers. And that makes it quite challenging. So these are the different issues. And I, I will, unfortunately, I need to also describe some more issues. But I also try to show them how those can be addressed. Uh, our perspective comes from doing AI solutions for the past 10 years. As being a consultancy, the, the funny part was that nobody bought these solutions for the first seven years. But for the, for the fa past three years, it's been, it's been much more nicer to be in this business. But I thought that I would take actually a slightly different angle. I would like to take an example how we are struggling ourselves applying AI in our own business. Not just how we consult our clients, but how we apply them in ourselves. And then we face all the same issues ourselves. And how do we apply them? How do we solve them? So the first steps, the four steps that we need to, of course, First, we need curiosity and action. I take the action as granted, so we do experiments and we do stuff. But then, what else? Number one, we need broadly to learn the AI technologies, what they do and what they don't do, what are the different capabilities. Then we need to understand what is the business impact that we are looking for, what is the intent, what is the agenda. Not just experimenting, but it needs to be an agenda. 
thirdly, we need to understand the data. What is the data that we have? What is the data we need? How, what is the quality, quantity, and so on of the data? And then fourthly, as we get on to the journey, we need to start looking into sort of what are the broad implications when we actually succeed in this kind of AI transformation. So what is the cultural impact? Number one, toolbox, AI toolbox. Quite a lot of the discussion in the, in the press goes around deep neural networks, which is a great um, technology, but there are lots of other things. And, and quite often what we see is that, that actually even linear regression is a powerful tool. We don't need to go into deep neural networks. And then we have clustering algorithms, we have Bayesian systems, we have expert systems, we have so on, so on, so on. And all those different technologies can be applied to different kind of problems. So it's not just neural network, it's, it's a lot of other things. And in order to actually, for everybody to understand and think what could be the toolbox here, you need to actually a little bit understand the algorithms. I don't think everybody needs to know how to code, but to understand how the algorithms work, like what is the situation, how much you need data, what kind of data and so on. And how we do it is that we have training program for the whole company. Yes, we have several tens of like hardcore data scientists, but still we have several hundreds of people who have more or less, and see some, some don't have probably any exposure to AI. So we are working, so we are providing, we already started this, but, but it will, well, of course it will take some time, but uh, everybody can join and everybody should join these this courses to get the basic understanding, start, whether it's person is from HR or for marketing or, or whatever the discipline. So that's one. I really recommend whether it's the own courses or, or some, some online courses and so on. And this especially I would say that this applies to the top management, even to the board of directors. My experience that, that somehow the willingness and interest to learn new stuff somehow reduces the higher you go in the hierarchy. And I, and I see this kind of that, that this is an area where the, 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 the top management, the CEOs, the boards really also need to get back to school and also admit that, that perhaps they don't know everything. Then where to begin with? We just did this, I don't think we did it as even this sort of systematic, but we went through, so we started thinking that what are the processes, the topics that frustrate us or that, that could be actually solved with data, what do we have, what, do we, what kind of data we have, and so on. And we went through this kind of dialogue. And we tried to identify a low-hanging fruit in terms of problem worth solving, but also something that we can rather easily solve. And then we identified one area. So before going to the demo, we realized, of course, we know that we are in the knowledge business, but unfortunately, it looks quite often like this. We have 550 people, I don't know, is it six, seven sites already? How, how do I know what we know and who knows about this? We have this internal discussion from us all the time going on. Who knows about this? Who knows about that? Have we done something like this? this or have we done some? Who knows about this client? Who knows about this technology? Who knows about this case? And it's a constant challenge to find who knows best. So we actually decided to try it whether we can actually solve this issue with data and AI. So we made a bubble burster. The, the idea is to make the, the break the bubbles that in the company forms via taking all sorts of data sources, calendars, project data, discussion forums, and a form a model who knows about and what. So now you can query whatever, and it gives information whether there are some digital footprints regarding that knowledge. I was thinking that even showing a quick demo, if you're interested. And first, internet, whether we have demo effect. Who wants to, who has an idea what to ask? Who wants to know? Give me a search query term. Which one? Fika. <laughs> like this? I have to say, let's say, what is the competence? So we have 
equally between designers and developers. And then there's some Henrik. Is Henrik here? I know you. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't know that much about Fika, but something. And then offices. Surprise, surprise, everybody in <laughs> Stockholm. Does someone else want to try something else? I don't, let's, we also, I can also, we could also, just quickly, not too much because we don't want to do anything stupid, we also give some indication why we indicate those. So let's, but, but if you give me sort of, just give me a next search term and then, then we can stop demoing. Anyone else? Project management. Whoops. Okay, now we have actually more, and we're only giving certain amount out, not to everybody, but then we have like more set, like let's say more equal distribution between the offices and then competencies and so on. Other, which might relate that, that we put project managers on the other competence. So this is a, and as a personal example, I was looking for who knows about HIPAA, and I had never even heard of HIPAA before, but, but that is related to healthcare. And then I went and went and I found one person who know, knew about HIPAA. Otherwise, would have started calling and asking and, and so on. So that's the sort of the example of, of one of the things that we did. And of course, we can then we take, can take this uh, much further and we are working on sort of like identifying the making sure that we understand what kind of knowledge, what kind of it the person actually do or, or, or talk, talker and so on. And how do we get impact and, and, and all those kind of things and visualizing the knowledge landscape and, and all those kind of things are under sort of the, the works. So that was our one experiment. Question. Yes. Yes, uh, CV is something that we will include as well. And, and of course, we are looking into like LinkedIn and all those. So just take how much, how fast we can include data sources. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook could be. <laughs> uh, good. But then that this is like a data driven AI. Of course, not everything needs to be purely out of. So then something that we've been doing also in the past is like, like where do we can extract expert knowledge? This is a com completely different approach then. So that we interview experts and ask what are the different factors affecting the project success? And whether building a model that, that, that combining the expert knowledge of people into sort of something that gives us indication whether we are doing something that is, is, is risky or not. So that is one of those examples. But then, although we like to do stuff, although we like to build, it's not just like building our own tools, it's also looking outside, and those are just illustrative examples, looking outside what other tools are available to, that actually can address our issues. So I think that if we look at, you remember CB Insights picture that I had, there's like hundreds and hundreds of different startups doing new kinds of tools. So I think it, it really makes sense to also look first where the somebody has solved the problem already instead of like start building it. So this is something that we also do. So we are looking for different startups, different companies that can actually provide tools to help us solve our business issues. But then this is a slide where I want to spend a little bit of more time because there are a couple of really important topics in my mind. So first of all, quite often when we start doing experiments, we focus on the this kind of application level, this kind of model level, whether we can solve something with AI, then of course we need data, but quite often the data comes that we take a data dump and then we start like cleaning the data and, and, and normalizing, fixing, whatever that is, pre-processing. And then we, we come to experiment and say, hey, we can, we can build a model and then that's good. But then the big question is, so what? Do we have actually impact? And then I think that the two really important topics that, that, that we are sort of learning all the time more and more, that actually the people interface and then this data infrastructure are really, really crucial in making the solution sort of like scale and, 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 and bring real value. What, I, what, what do I mean by people interface? Let's take speech. So we are applying speech recognition so that we could capture knowledge from speech. Technology-wise, it actually seems to be quite 
in good shape. But the biggest questions are, how do we actually bring it to people workflows? And what is the sort of the usability, what is the design approach that makes people comfortable? Where do we actually ask people to, to create new habits so that we can capture knowledge? And as at least in our company, nothing gets done when you order people to do something. How do you actually then get people to do something? Or do we attach to existing workflows? So for example, we start listening to conversations that people have. But then do people feel quite scared or, or is that a comfortable approach if we start sort of like listening to conversations? So the question is, what is the proper design approach? And that is something that we experiment and don't get me wrong, we are not, not eavesdropping people. So, but, but, but I think that it illustrates the challenge that it's not a technical challenge. It's a user interface, it's a design challenge. Then uh, also one of the most interesting topics during the last weeks is that, that, that more and more there's like, like the question of how do we bring complex systems to people so that they, they, they can extract value. And I've been so inspired with one approach lately. The biggest innovation, human. We put person in between. Because quite often it's really difficult to actually build so good systems that they automatically attach to the workflows and people's habits so that they actually can use them and they are happy to use them out of the box. So I've seen a, a couple of cases where you put a person in between so that the interface to the people, actual people, is a human, which is very natural interface. So there's a person interpreting the, the information coming from the systems and helping people adopt. And, and when I saw this used in, in one context, I was really amazed that, hey, that's a really cool way to do it because that is a natural interface. Then you actually get value out immediately and then you can start building the, the machine interface little by little so that it actually brings value and people can use it. Then additional topic is that quite often when we talk about data, we need new data. We need to get some data out of the people. And how do you bring, create a design so that you actually get people to contribute to the data side? And that is a design issue again. There's so many design issues coming when we start actually applying AI to workflows and the processes. And even when we start rethinking the processes, more and more design issues. And I think that if something should be addressed when we actually move from experimentation to real world, getting value, it's a design part. Then the data part. Yes, of course we need data, of course, but quite often in the experimentation phase it's about like taking a data dump. But, uh, but I think the key topic is to build an infrastructure when you create this kind of data preprocessors and, and, and so on, that those are also available for the next experiment or the next application. And building a proper data as service, it takes time. And unfortunately, it takes also money. But if we really, really want to start extracting a lot of value out of AI solutions, I think there's no choice. We need to build proper data infrastructure. And of course, I, I don't. I think that it shouldn't be built as a just a platform for two years and then it's ready. But whenever we build individual solutions, we need to make sure that the, every single solution contributes to the platform to the data as a service platform, so that the next experiment, the next application is easier and easier. But I, quite often I see that, that, that the way it works is that you take a data dump, you create a preprocessor, and then next time you try next one and, and, and so on, and it doesn't contribute to the overall infrastructure. Good. Then a couple of comments about the industry maturity. Let's start from the non-technical ones. I think that if we look at open source software, if we look at a lot of others, there's already good existing legal frameworks. But we are almost, at least I haven't seen, if somebody knows, let me know, we haven't seen proper legal frameworks, something that patterns that, that you can easily take if you have this kind of issue, use this kind of legal approach for data, data sharing, all those kind of things. That is needed. I'm, somewhat involved personally in one of those exercises where it, the, the goal is to create this kind of patterns that if you are trying to do this, this might be the legal framework. Why is this important? Because quite especially in the bigger organizations, if you don't have this kind of legal frameworks available, it might be really, really challenging to actually that do the 
final solutions. Then, of course, uh, AI brings the, the question of ethics. Again, we need those kind of standards. We need those kind of like patterns so that we don't always need to start from scratch thinking about it. And this is something where we contributed recently. So we created our version of, of uh, principles for ethical AI to start the conversation so that we have something and we share them. Then our little contribution to the technical side is, is that during these 10 years of work, uh, there was a realization that, that perhaps there's a different way of doing AI. Maybe in certain contexts we can do it in much, much more productive way. On the right top, uh, lower right-hand corner, you see typical way of doing AI, which is like Python code. But then there was a sort of like innovation where we could, in certain contexts, we could include automatically the AI functionality in the database and use it almost like an SQL query. And that way, in those contexts where it works, re reduce the investment level like, like with one zero. And of course, this is our small contribution, but I'm promised that, that Google's, Microsoft and those are all looking like and, and doing the democratization so that we get the productivity to completely different level in the AI sp uh, technology space, product space. And I think the world will look quite different in, in two, three, four years time. Of course, we still have the data issue. Of course, we need to still have the data understanding. But also one thing that I think that will be that, that, that sort of more and more people can actually apply powerful AI, not just data scientists, but developers and so on. Good. Then we move on to sort of abstraction level higher. If we started from this kind of, hey, let's solve this constant questioning, who knows about what, then how do we build ourselves the strategy and the agenda? Have we had a clear strategy or agenda day one? No. That's why we are applying a, an approach where the strategy comes as number three. So first we decided to act. First we started having those ideas, idea backlog. Then we are experimenting. And based on the experimentation, we get insights to the strategy. We don't even want to finalize our strategy before we run enough experiments so that we learn. If we, only, if we want to make a strategy before we do experiments, I think that, that at least not our level of thinking is good enough. I don't think we can build perfect strategy without actually start acting. But then we also need to remember that we just can't keep on experimenting. We also need to make a proper strategy, proper agenda. So that is the sort of that we are currently very much iterating between the options, experiments and the strategy. And I think that it's, it's coming together. But still we are very strong in this kind of uh, hypothesis experiment phase. But I think this could be also a solution, and we've already seen this solution in, in many ways, organizations where there's a need to have a clear process and need to have a clear strategy. So the process here is that, that do not strategy only number three, don't do it first, but don't forget it. And, and here it could be also that, that we, we let the top management to, to decide the strategy, but then we can experiment on broad sort of scope. And then Again, something that, that we are sort of keeping in our mind all the time, in what phase are we in? So in the first phase, I call it like from chaos to experimentation. That is the sort of the starting point. We need to get something done. But then we need to all the time try to get out of the box number one to actually box number two, which is like solid value delivery. So there's a, the, the x-axis is time and then we have see the value. And then we need to understand what is the criteria for moving from box number one to box number two. In our case, it's do we have a clear agenda? Do we have data infrastructure there? Do we have certain use cases that are actually sort of bringing value and, and, and so on? Do we have those in place? So that, that we actually then can start getting more and more value constantly. And then all the time keep in mind the phase number three, which is optional, where do we actually want to transform the business. So if the box number two is actually improving the existing business, whether we want to sort of like more holistically transform the business. But I think it makes really sense to all the time keep in mind that where are we in the maturity and all the time make sure that, that we get out of the box number one. So either it's, we end up in box number two, which is good box or box number three, depending on the situation. 
and then we get to this like what is the sort of the ambition level and and then we can sort of like one way to do it is like with five levels of, of ambition and to simplify it so whether we are shaping existing business so number one is just get some insight out, out of it so we use AI to analyze and get learning number two we use it to in interact and engage for example we we use it for for chatbots or we use it uh, for for predictive maintenance and so on in our case the number two box is, is more on the sort of this kind of knowledge stuff then number three is that whether we transact whether we automate whether we let the ai to do the decisions on behalf of us for example in in the the marketing uh, automatic uh, programmable sort of like ad uh, purchases systems i think they are quite far away on the automation side but then the number four is that whether we build new business or whether we even want to actually change the business what we are in but why is this important of course it helps to align the activities but the organizational culture and the governance for improving existing business and building new one is quite different that is needed Typically the four and five, they are more longer term, they are more uncertain, there needs a lot of innovation, trial and error, versus the one and two and three, it might be easier to make a ROI calculation or, or make these project plans and tell everybody else what is the, the value out of there. And that is a topic of completely different presentation, the different governance systems for exploring or exploiting. And then finally, something that we keep in mind all the time, is this kind of different organizational dogmas and we have the classic one top down if we have an uncertainty let's plan it away and so on and and it's the decision making is like hippo the highest person highest paid person's opinion then we have the innovation culture is where we experiment stuff we love uncertainty we fail fast the decisions are made bottom up and so on and i would say that we are 99 percent in the middle box ourselves but then we have the third, third transformation of the dogma coming up is the data and ai if we have uncertainty instead of experimenting or instead of planning we try to find data sources that actually give us the answers or who makes the decisions maybe it's the data that makes the decision and so on so we actually might have a completely different looking organizational culture and of course it's not just that we choose one but i think this the clever application of different organizational dogmas cultures in different sort of situations and how do we blend for example in our case the innovation culture and the data culture and i think that is a crucial for our long-term success i don't think that we should go 100 percent to the data and ai culture but i think that we have a lot of to gain from the data and ai into our innovation culture so these are of course the long-term topics to to consider Good. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think I'm a good example of the learning uh, <laughs> the track that we're having on AI right now. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to take a few questions now. Michelle and uh, Emmalena have a microphone, so if anybody would like to ask a question, please just raise your hand and they'll come to you. Hi, I'm interested to know how, uh, how much did you involve your customers and how did you ask them to give you of you as a company and your opportunities compared to your internal analysis? Um, I would say that, that um, in this, initially not much, so we started internally just like we wanted to get something done, but now it actually is quite strong involvement, discussing with, with clients and so on. But I would say that in many topics there is, um, clients are interested in this, this knowledge management stuff, but they are not demanding us to do this transformation. They are demanding a lot of other stuff, but not this transformation. And I think that is also a challenge in this kind of transformation that, that if we would only do something that is beneficial in the short term, we wouldn't be doing this because this is not like this is not bringing ROI in the short term. 
So we also need to have our own sort of point of view towards the future. But now I think the your question, now we are talking with a lot of our clients and, and they're getting giving us a lot of interesting feedback. Good. Hey, my name is Rita. I'm very impressed by your bubble borster <laughs> because I think, I mean, uh, the problem of finding the right people for Ryan job, especially in the big uh, international companies are huge. It's mm -hmm. like if you don't know someone, you hardly will find yep. it. So my question is, how many companies actually deployed this solution? I mean, the big international, and I refer mm -hmm. to second part, how GDPR regulation yeah. <laughs> about the privacy yeah. <laughs> will stop from deployment of those, right. you know, crawling into the private mails and collecting yeah. information. So, um, easy answer to your first question, that the bubble burst has been built for our internal use. So it's us using it currently, but, but due to the sort of request and demand, we are looking into so that, that we could also deployed to, to, to our, our clients. And I think this was actually very happy surprise for us that, that, that it, it, it gets interest also. Then the, the GDPR part, I think that the currently the approach that we are using is that we are using only public information. So the, of course, company public information sources. So that, that if your calendar is, is not public, then we don't use the data. We, we only get, if you write, if you write your, if you write to our internal discussion forum, of course you, you sort of like, uh, uh, sort of like we get the data from there. If you remove your uh, text from the internal systems, it, it gets away from the, the bubble burst. So bubble burst is not a master data base at the moment. It's just take it, taking the data from other sources. And I think it's currently probably weekly or daily. I can't remember now or no, doesn't know exactly right now. Hello. Um, uh, you said that um, it you started working with um, AI 10 years ago, but it was actually three years ago. Like It took you seven years to get your first clients to make yeah. business out of it. So I was wondering, what is the, what was the breakthrough? It's like, war, what were the needs that make uh, your clients actually uh, embark on one of those things? And if you look at that now, it's like, what has changed for those uh, for those businesses like three years later, how, f how far they have gone? I think that certain industries like media very far. So, so, but of course, like many industries, just starting an experimentation phase. But I think if we look at the gaming industry, if we look at the media industry, they of course very far already, and coming up with new solutions. I don't know what has changed that much except the market understanding and acceptance and this kind of awareness. I think that is, and of course, there's more and more data sources. But I, I think that that is not the biggest. I think the biggest is just generic awareness and understanding that, hey, this could be applicable to our business as well. And of course, like during the, those year one and seven, of course, there were some individual cases like certain search engines and so on. But, but uh, let's put it this way, it was like the most of the data scientists that we haven't that many, they were doing something else mostly than, than data science because of the lack of client demand. Do we have any more questions? There was one there. I think after this question, we'll move on. Yeah. And then you can still keep your questions for afterwards as well. Uh, you talked a bit about the challenge between having a, uh, the sort of envisioned impact of AI yeah. and the actual realization yeah. of it. Um, and that sounds a little bit like some technologies we've heard of in the past, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not the first time. But I'm wondering from your perspective, what's the biggest challenge? Is it you know, having more to do with uh, client understanding or the way that problems are formulated? Is it to do with maturity level of some of the tools? W where is the biggest sticking point when it comes to actually falling short or, or meeting those expectations? Um, okay, if I answer, an answer this way, um, I think, I, do, I don't think I have one single topic, but if I, like a longer perspective, I have a AI training from the 90s. So, so, and and if I look at the situation, the algorithms are almost the same. And and of course, I forgot all the the practical stuff of that during the, the 18 years that I was on the business side. But what changed during those 18 years? We had uh, lots of lots of computing power more, and and we have lots of data. 
and and of course most of the algorithms are, are roughly the same. So that so that that was the combination. Now I think that that the next level of this kind of like what what makes it more applicable is that that it's not just one thing. It's a lot of things. It we need the legal frameworks. We need the ethical frameworks. We need the sort of the the, the products that are more productive to use. We need the generic understanding what can be done. And, and I think that's the sort of, even in the similar, some, you mentioned robotics, I think we see the same, that combination of battery, combination of AI, combination of different components together suddenly make it so that it actually takes the next level. And I think that's something that, that is required. I think that companies should start now, like we did as well, already, and not just wait for the, the, the next big way, but I think that there will be a completely different level of productivity in a few years' time, combining these different aspects. Cool. Thank you, Thomas. I get the microphone again, mm. but because I got another one that's <laughs> not <you>. working. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm just going to, oh, sorry, very briefly. Can I introduce you to our second speaker today? So uh, welcome, Rudolf Peters, who's the founder okay. of and CEO of Creative AI. Let's check if your microphone's working. Yes, working. Yeah, perfect. Great. I can do this for you. Do you have yes, it well there? practiced. There you go. Let you just present. Hello, everyone. Yeah, perfect. So let's see if this. So I'll try to keep it um, somewhere in a 25, 30 minutes as well. Um, so I'm CEO of uh, Creative AI. We're like a small startup spread out across Europe. It's always a bit hard to explain where we're based uh, since we're distributed. So we're in almost any major city in Europe, but it's probably just one of us. Um, we work with creative agencies and brands, uh, mainly across Europe, a little bit US, um, and we build creative solutions uh, as well, all kind of yeah, more weird things, of which I will show a little bit uh, today. Um, but before I do, um, before I went into the field of computer science, I was an anthropologist. Um, and this is kind of the famous book by Margaret Mead, Coming of Age in Samoa, which led to um, the, the discipline, almost, I would say, of field work, where people would ingrain themselves into a culture, really take the time to understand what is going on. Um, and then w w with a lot of criticism from the discipline that this was not really the way to go, um, over time, this became the new standard. Um, and this is where I hope uh, we are today with AI as well. I think we're at kind of early, early times. We're looking very much at the technical challenges, less at how we can make these things as a, as a part of society. Uh, Thomas mentioned ethical framework, legal frameworks, uh, GDPR, etc. I think those are all part of the, the discussion. Um, but it's also just as much as countries like Canada are now giving everyone, you know, any, any inhabitant of Canada can have like a, a free year of education in AI. That's great, like to understand what is going on with AI, but it should always be the opposite as well, where engineers who on up until now could really play around a lot in, you know, basements and, and, and I'm an engineer as well, so I'm a computer scientist as well. So I think I, I'm allowed to say this. Uh, we as engineers and as friends, we, we really like to play with technology and see things as technical solutions. Um, but it might also be quite useful to think of these in a more cultural uh, sense. So I think this is kind of where we are and we have a choice uh, where we want to take this. And so creativity and AI, I will make a very short, um, going back a little bit in time, where, where, where I talk about creative AI or creativity in AI, where all of this comes from. Um, so this is the first, you can see it's still like a mainframe, it was like as big as kind of, maybe not this building, but definitely as big as my living room. Um, it was a German manufactured mainframe and it was the first poem written um, by very simple rules, but already what was then AI. And what was interesting in these, ti these times, 60s, 70s, that computer scientists would, the majority of time, they would think, they would sit, they would write, they would read, because mainframes were expensive, and running a command would take the entirety of the day. So you would have a lot of time to think about. And the other thing which is interesting that currently a lot of the thoughts that from that period, from the 70s especially, are now kind of finding their way back into the popular imagination and people really finding a lot of inspiration both in AI, but also in the field where we're very much focused on this creative AI in the design. Um, let's see if the audio works.
Can I have some audio? Maybe it's silence. This was the first video produced with what I would call creative AI. So it's a, a ballet piece um, by a um, mathematician artist, uh, Nolan, in uh, the 70s. And this was like groundbreaking. This was like people crying in the office about the beauty of this wonderful ballet. Um, And where we are today, more ballet. Still no sound. Yeah, I put it on. Um, so what you see here, there's a source for this is, Do some people know style transfer? People heard of this, it's the idea of one image, which you like, you have a style of a particular other image, and you say, well, let me transform this image in this particular style. Um, and there's some examples of this is essentially what's being done here. So you have the source video, um, you have the pose you detected, and then this video is being transferred to images of these people who are the two researchers at MIT who have written um, the, the article and the kind of done the research who definitely cannot dance like this. Um, another example. And the interesting thing here is that you can, with very limited data, you can already do these kind of very interesting things. And this is where AI becomes creative, where you can start to think about more than just the bling, about what can we do with this when we put this into tool and when we put it into the hands of creative professionals. Um, do we remember this one? It was a team of around 100 studio professionals who made this, uh, this clip. And this is where we are now. It's a model by NVIDIA. This is all not real people, but all generated. Not perfect, but you, you get the ID on high resolution for the first time. Uh, more examples from style transfer type things, audio. Here the input is being transferred into a different style. So what is being played is some piano and it transfers. An example, Metallica. Let's put Metallica into a neural network and see if it's transferred to some classical music. And now for my absolute favorite. See, I'm a big Rana fan. And this, of course, doesn't mean that musicians will be out of a job soon. This actually means that just that, like, the drum machine didn't, you know, had an end to drummers or, or music. These are just new tools, new ways of creative expression, of creating music, creating arts. Um, so, now for the game which everybody always likes to play. Human or machine? Anyone? How many people think it's human? How many people think it's AI, deep learning? Maybe f almost 50 50, a little bit more people human. Yes, exactly. It's actually Chopin. Um, so the interesting thing, if I would have introduced this saying, now there is AI coming and it will be fantastic, your, your idea would change. You would immediately think, oh, it's AI and it's even greater. But the concept would still be uh, the same. We can actually produce these things AI without problems. But the interesting part is not so much if AI can produce music. The interesting part is more, what does it mean and how can we use this? Um, another example. This is... If this poetry generated by a machine or by this handsome dude with sunglasses? Human, who thinks it's Shakespeare? Who thinks it's not Shakespeare, but a machine? Almost no hands. Come on, don't be shy. We're in Sweden, I know. <laughs> it's actually machine generated. So this was uh, one of these deep neural networks uh, Thomas mentioned. 
Um, so it's interesting when you start training these systems, you can also really start to learn more about language. So when they're kind of, you know, little and shy, and you just start training these models, they will start to understand grammar slowly, they will understand language, but over time they become more and more grown up and they start to generate more of these things that make sense. Um, and then you can start controlling them. And I think on the, on the AI side, as an AI researcher, we're very much only in the beginning of putting the right levers on there that we can play with them. Um, there are the first science fiction, uh, Roman Sloan is a science fiction writer who has created his own bot which produces uh, text, but then he always creates different possibilities and he uses it more as a creative expression for trying to get out of the rut of his own style and get kind of ideas. So I think where these models can be very useful is for ideation, for exploration, uh, things like this. And this is the paper, Deep, S Deep Spear. Um, another example of the hype of AI. The Whopper is back. It never left, but it's back. Flame grilled, just like you. With vegetables, fresh and flying, just like you. The Whopper lives in a bun mansion, just like you. Order yourself today. Burger King, have it Uruguay. BK logo appears. So actually this was not AI at all. This was 80 people thinking really hard from a big ad agency about if they could make fun out of AI. And they presented it as AI. And it was inspired by an actual AI model. Um, but then they actually couldn't do it and said, oh, we can still pretend and, and do. So this shows the hype of AI. So when, whenever you see somewhere AI does this or AI solves this, um, probably it's 80% hype, I mean, there's 20% truth in there. So if you want to apply these things for business, always look a little bit further than the, the headlines. So back to creativity and design then. Creative tools today, on the one hand, we have Photoshop, we have Illustrator, we have these kind of tools. On the other hand, to the right, for computer scientists, AI researchers, we have terminals and Python code. Um, and with Creative AI, we try to bring these two worlds together. Um, we think these are what we call you know, generation 1.0 creative tools. These are tools that essentially format their users. They're, they're tools where, where you, with a steep learning curve, the, and the, the barrier to entry is, is very high. You have to really be well educated to be able to use these tools. Um, and they're also not really playful. So they actually restrict you in many, many ways of how you can um, write. They're, they're the furthest away you could think of from when you're drawing, you know, for real. It changes a little bit with, with iPad and things like this, but they're not the kind of tools uh, we envision when we think about creativity and AI together. Um, deep learning, you could almost see as like, having a lot of people working on something, you know, the data plugging, trying to find the right data, 80% spent on mostly the data processing stuff, finding the right data, cleaning it. It's a lot of hard, hard labor. Um, generally, the world is full with complex software. Um, and our vision is with AI that software will become actually less complex, not more complex. Um, and this is again, yeah, you can see I'm a bit of a historian, <laughs> but we go back to the 70s. On the one hand, we had um, when AI just came kind of um, out of the, the first crash. Um, on the one hand, you had um, the Stanford Information Group led by Alan McKay on the left, and they really believed in um, um, intelligence amplification as a means to make AI for AI's sake. So it was a very technical or engineering oriented approach, which is kind of what we talk about Right now, when we talk about AI, we talk about making AI smart and building things on top of AI, but not so much about how can we have human in the loop? How can we actually take the human central or, or the user central and think that that should be kind of the goal, which is what Douglas Engelbart on the right um, really was focused on with his group um, at SRI and also at the Augmentation Center. Um, and he's the inventor of the mouse, of the desktop computer, of almost everything. Uh, we use for computing right now. So he was focused on tools. So now on one hand we have, uh, and of course it's always a bit challenging to say it here at the epicenter, we have the singularity approach, the AGI, the automation. On the other hand, we have design, human-centric, human-computer interaction. Um, and I think that we could learn a lot kind of from history and also going back there. Um, One of the metaphors I would like to talk about to explain how these things then might work, if we take a bit more design-centered approach to AI, is maps. I'm a big fan of maps. Um, they're never real, but they're, they're useful models. So when I wanted coffee somewhere here near Epicenter, I can you know, take out my phone and I can find just special for me, a specialized, personalized map 
of places to drink coffee. Isn't that wonderful? Um, maps also work really well with AI systems that are already really kind of automated systems, but we can take these systems and we can create maps out of them to try to debug them, understand what they're doing. So here we have all images generated by one of these AI models. Um, and we have the different kind of parameters it can generate. And if you put this in a map, we really get a kind of a good sense of what these models are capable of. Um, it's only step one, understanding. Like step two is, you know, putting it in the hands of people, making people play with it, having a user interface, thinking about what these things can do in particular settings. Um, an example of, of a map is also one of the most famous AI data sets, MNIST, from cl classical digit. Um, recognition. So you can really see here, this is how you can see the, the neural network learning over time. And you can see that if you don't only look at like the numbers of a neural network saying, hey, it's going better or worse, it's becoming more and more common to actually look at visualizations of the internal workings of a neural network that is meaningful to people. Um, and that changes a lot how we think about AI, if we think of it as just another tool. Um, another example of, of this, how we can use maps as a metaphor to explore existing data. So this is a model um, was made by uh, Mario Klingemann uh, for Google Art, Google AI Art. Um, on the left, you see the, the, I will show it one more time. You see two images to the left and to the right, and then it automatically tries to find a path between them. And it's not generating anything, it's just trying to find existing examples of what is in a, in a big catalog. Um, so it's pretty interesting for just exploring what is in there. Um, so this is, what the map behind the scenes looks like. So this is another extraction point from a map, which is you know, one way of abstraction of representations. You can make another higher level abstraction and you can make it more meaningful. So this is, you can, uh, you can go there to Google AI, you will find this link. Um, completely useless, just way too much data. It's kind of more bling of AI, it looks cool, but it's completely impractical. Um, if you go back to this, you can get these different kinds of examples of Paths, however, so if you build a nice interface on top of it, it becomes very useful. So you can see, okay, what if I would go from one mask to the left all the way to uh, Raphael, or my, my favorite as a, as a Dutchman, Van Gogh to a Monet, what looks in between. So these are interesting explorations you can then have for artistic uh, use or, or for, for almost anything. So you can build models on top of models. So maps are models, they're useful. So you understand they're still, still kind of models. But we're, we're getting at an age where these models become very modular, we can swap them in and out on top of existing AI models, and we can start playing with them. So we're, we're really in a kind of a, a candy storm, a time of play uh, and expression. Another example. So here we can draw something, um, and the AI automatically sketches what it thinks it is. And, you have, and here you have many different models. This is a model which knows a lot about grass and flowers. Um, and it's trained on a lot of sketches of people. So it is essentially what people would kind of draw. So you get kind of the prototypical approach to drawing. Um, but again, you can do the opposite. So you can take that approach and you can make a map out of it. And you get these kind of things from a model of just for yoga. So then you can start analyzing it. You have things like digital humanities looking at this actually now a research project going on at Cambridge um, where they're looking at AI models from um, a cultural studies perspective, saying what are the kind of biases when you're drawing things like yoga poses or flowers um, along gender lines, about around culture lines, uh, things like this. So we can start to really reinterpret our own history with these kind of models as well. Um, and how then we might look at these things as a more structured way when we think about what are the kind of things we can do with this, we can look back at cybernetics, which is the idea that everything is like a feedback loop. So everything is, it's, it's very zen almost. Everything is connected to everything uh, and everything influences everything. Um, but we might have the people to the left, we have the AI, which I thought to, to dumb it down a little bit, just have it as a washing machine, but it's a smart washing machine. It has some Wi-Fi. We have the, the model, which is generated. So this is then the model, the map, which is generated interactively. And then we can start to think about like how can we use this? So we can create simplified versions of the model. You could imagine like a user interface already for which feeds back into the model. So it's some interactive feedback into the AI. And to the left, we can start playing with it and these things. So these are ways, just one of the ways how you could look at already these things more than just training a neural network as a data scientist. Um, and there are more, more approaches of this. We can see fonts, Adobe and others. There's an open standard right now for um, variable fonts. So every any font on the web 
a lot of new fonts on the web, they're variable. And that means that they're kind of like a map. So you have serif, you have bold, you have etc. But they're all kind of the same, the same kind of aesthetic property. It's still recognizable as a particular style, but you can play around with it. You can make it custom. Um, and there's interesting things you can think about. Like imagine reading a book where the shape and the form of the, the type you're reading changes with the emotion expressed in the book. Um, for instance, still the same font, but it might, you know, if there's like a very emotional scene, it, you know, goes a little bit sh slow. If it's very, you know, very harsh or angry, it's very big and fat and bold. Um, then we have the neural network approach. So that's all very nice and structured, which still looks like this. So there's still a big um, gap to bridge there, but there's people playing with this. Um, so this is a neural network approach, kind of trying to do the same thing but miserably failing. Um, so what I would argue is that we need to redefine AI-assisted interfaces as human-friendly interfaces. Um, and more examples of that, how we might think about putting interfaces on this. Here it's um, Memo Acton, um, artist from, uh, from London who takes an extremely simple model. So this is almost doing the opposite, having an exceptionally simple model who only knows C, and then trying to find ways elsewhere than other time. Um, and then put some interesting way of like letting it interpret the world, but miserably failing. But then the kind of failure of a neural network or an AI system actually becomes a really good property. So you can use these things actually in unexpected uh, things. Another way, how we go back to the, the earlier kind of model of faces. So these are all generated semi-real faces. They might be sometimes a little bit similar, never really the same. But just putting some simple interface on it, you can start playing around with it. Maybe make yourself. You can actually upload yourself. It will transfer, find your spot in this space as well. And you will have your face and you can make, I definitely should. You can check my Twitter feed some other time. You will see pictures of me with makeup and stuff like this. Um, so, I don't have much time to go into the whole depth of why I think this is important and what is the kind of future this hopefully will bring us to, but also the kind of dangers and augmentation versus automation and etc. But there's a, there's a blog post which it's quite old already now. It's like two two and a half three years old. Um, but yeah, check that out if you're interested. It's still quite quite relevant. Um, so, AI as an instrument then. Um, this is one experiment we did with, uh, with IDEO in, uh, in Munich. So this is a way of playing with AI as an instrument. So it's a, a mixing board, a DJ table, where on the left side you see like mature fitting, you have the kind of personality types, so you can tr play around with what is the map you might want. And to the right you have your, you know, your scratching table and you can play around with variations. Um, and this is one way to try to play with the idea of branding, like who am I as a, as a person, what is my brand. Um, but instead of only doing exercises around this on paper, have actually like a visual component that is already generated on the fly um, from this. Another example of that. Oh, and then in the end, when you're done, you can print out your, your personal style guide uh, and you can send it and say, okay. Um, another way how we could look at these things is think about language, think about trying to create a common um, language of creativity. There's all kinds of design languages and ideas. Could we not try to find ways of that things like design gestalts? Could we not put that into a machine? And could instead of doing like pixel pushing or whatever in, in Photoshop, could we not work on a very high level, cognitive level, when we think about you know force or strength or contrast or opposing forces or, or any of those kind of things where you talk about when you're a designer? Could we not work purely on that level, have that as the kind of levers of control? Um, and we're, this, this is very inspired by Chris. So to the left is the kind of properties we came up with. To the right is the, it's very much based on the work of Christopher Alexander, which is kind of his, his properties as an architect. So that's him. Most of the wonderful places in the world were made by people, not architects. Um, you probably know why then he's not very much liked by fellow architects. Um, and this is another, um, so this is a tool we, we've developed to, to yeah, play around with these things on a, it's a quite simple version still, but it kind of gets the job done. So you have a simple ad or poster, 
Um, it automatically creates it. You can play around again. There's a map. You can explore around the map. You can pick the design you like. And then there's these different kind of properties on a high level. And there's AI then used to interpret this, saying, OK, here, globally, I want a little bit more contrast. On this particular local thing, I want a little bit more strength, make that higher. And it's not that then, so you sacrifice fine grain control. But what you get big, what you get back is exploration and, and kind of conceptualization. And we're not saying that this then should be kind of the final finished design, but it's an easy way of experimenting or brainstorming, ideating um, around design. And then in the end, there's the kind of the, the, the thing you also saw, which you still see here, which is because it's all fully responsive, you get kind of the different formats for different social media or whatever you get for free since it's all um, so automation then in our belief is kind of augmentation and automation are kind of false opposing forces as well in certain ways you would argue that um, in many of the creative industries there's a lot of designers behaving like robots um, and nobody likes it they don't like it their managers don't like it it's pixel pushing um, so automating that away might be a very humane thing to do um, then there's other things where, where people really like their job and they don't want you to automate it, then maybe augmentation is the way to go. So I don't think technology should be the driving force of deciding these things, if you should automate or augment something. Uh, I think it should be people and us as a society who makes this choice, like what do we want to do um, and what are the things we want to get rid of and outsource to machines. Um, so this is the, the tool. It's a, it's a small peak preview of Bloom. Huh? Um, so you start with selecting your formats. Um, you can select some images or so, some, some background elements. So you can play around with different design elements here. Um, you see someone adding a, a background element. There's AI in the loop which automatically you know, makes a proposal of like what are the objects that are interesting to, to look at. Um, what this design is we like to call focal points. Maybe a logo you want to add. Um, and then some copy and maybe you want to even have, because it's all generative, you can create all kinds of copies and make all kinds of variations for it. But for this example, just, um, just one copy. So that's the kind of design components. You can have a hierarchy where you say, okay, what, what is the kind of order of importance here? Um, and then you can create different styles. You say, what is my, maybe you have just one style, like a brand style. Maybe you want to play around with different styles. So you can select different styles and add them to it. Um, it can make images, you know, it can do uh, color treatment automatically. So you don't have to like swap it out to, from tool to tool to tool. Um, and then essentially what you get is like, again, a map, um, an explorer as we call it, if all the different formats you've chosen, um, with automatically different crops made depending on your focal points, and also automatically styled and kind of the components placed. Um, then you can select the ones you like, you can, you know, check the difference. So if here someone only chose two formats, you have the other format, more like a square Instagram type format. Um, you select the format you like. This is only step one. You should always be, all be able to overwrite. Like AI, we consider smart-ish, right? But it's always the kind of the backup option. It's never, the human should always be able to overwrite the AI um, because it's just a tool, right? You should be able to do whatever. So you should always be able to go in uh, and make whatever choices you want to, to change it. So maybe you, you want to change the composition a little bit. You want to change the text a little bit. Then it does all kinds of smart things, right? So you can change it to automatically make you know, the place the text where it thinks it is. Um, so you can try here then combine where, where what we call negotiated agency. So agency of human and machine is a negotiation which then is dependent on the context and you're able to control. And then once you're done, you select them, you download them or upload them to the particular social media formats and you're, you're off, ready to go. Another example of this is uh, which uh, Thomas also shortly the has one example is, into two is um, Adobe. The design viewer uh, on the uh, sorry, Autodesk, the which does similar designs. things for mechanical engineering. And a collection of tools for visualizing, selecting, and filtering the metadata associated with the designs on the right. As selections and filtering actions are made on the right, the collection of displayed designs updates on the left. So that's essentially it. So you have a map. You can zoom in. You can play around with parameters. And this has been quite successful for mechanical engineering, trying to optimize particular properties of material design, uh, making materials like for Airbus, for planes, that are twice as strong and twice as um, light, uh, things like this. So I'll skip all of this. This becomes a little bit too sales pitchy, but it's all the stuff we can do, virality prediction. And so if you're interested in kind of some of these things, then you can talk. So where are we now? Um, 
this is um, another generative model. So there's two kinds of AI models nowadays, you would say. Like on the one hand, you have models which can recognize the world and say what it is. It says, oh, that's an image of a cat. On the other hand, you have models which can generate things, say, hey, generate me an image of a cat. So this is a model that for the first time, you see on the left an image where someone is looking at. Then there's a model which only has access to the brain, brain scans, fMRI brain scans. And purely from the brain activity, the image on the right is generated. So this is a way how actually purely from, from brain waves, we can start to visualize using machine learning what someone is actually looking at. Um, could be to interpret dreams, it could be when people are having a stroke or when they are in the coma, things like this. Um, next to all the nefarious purposes you can also dream out, of course. Um, other interesting developments is that for the first time a purely gener generative adversarial network, the GANS, it's, it's kind of a hot term, it's, uh, the, the Lumen Prize, a quite prestigious art prize in, in London, has been won by, by the same Mario Klingemann for his painting here. Um, then we also have Obvious, which is three um, quite random, came from Phenoma, random computer scientist students from, from France, who had a quite an awful painting from a technical perspective. I mean, it's really they, um, but they sold it for almost a half a million. So generative art sells, so maybe we're doing the wrong thing, we should just be producing paintings. Um, to see that this is kind of more baloney, so even the formula for the computer scientist here is wrong. So figures. And this is the discussion going on, on on Twitter. So what these guys actually did is they took, and I'm not saying this is they shouldn't have done this, like I think it's totally fine and probably I'm one of the few people who think so. So they took the code of another um, actually quite young 19 year old computer scientist, like a student. Um, they took his code for crawling the images used for training the neural network, took his code to also then generate the images and they also tried to pester him all the time over internet to get him to release the pre-trained model so they didn't even have to do the training. Um, and then there's all kinds of discussions around it. What does it mean? Because there's a lot of money in the loop now that is being sold. Um, and the main problem here is that because there's so much stuff going on in computer science world where people build things on top of each other, which is a really good thing, um, credit where credit is due becomes very important. Um, and that's something which they, they probably could have done a little bit better. Uh, more style transfer, anybody can recognize what this is? I don't even know the artist says CCX or so, something like this, who style transfer herself and her background uh, dancers to the Spice Girls. So this is where the, this weird style transfer you s stuff you saw in the beginning is already used to kind of aid or, or replace part of the CGI process. So this is a, you know, MTV type uh, music video where yeah, with very relatively minor effort, um, they could just project like a Spice Girl type thing onto themselves. Um, anybody knows this Instagram account? Yeah. It's like a million followers, something. Um, also completely fake, generated uh, with software. So there's millions of followers, it's like quite active, quite interesting, it looks semi-realistic. Um, so there used to be a lot of discussion if it was real or not until it was, you know, released that it's not. And this is kind of what is growing as well, kind of digital avatars, like fakes, as it's also called, like spreading from um, automatically generated baby videos on YouTube, um, which is like sometimes quite good, sometimes quite strange and weird and, and not really the stuff you want your baby to look at, but it's big business. Um, and so this is the other kind of things we're going to see that everything will be generated. It's a friend of, of mine from, uh, from Berlin, Jean. Uh, so Gene also likes to play around with this kind of things. So it's style transfer himself to his uh, idol. No. <laughs> um, so in conclusion, like AI can really do great things, like generative models, the type of model that generate things. It's quite high resolution images we can create, um, but at the same time they do miss the kind of common sense, which is the hardest to learn, like spiders with way too many legs and clocks with like too many also legs, like clock legs. Um, so I knew Thomas was going to cover the business side, so that's why I focused a little bit more on, the, on this um, generative stuff. But some, some final small words on the business side, um, if you want to apply some AI, whether creative AI or generally just AI to, to a business. Um, before I ran Creative AI, I ran a small um, consultancy company where I probably made all these mistakes. Um, 
So we did a little like small, small proof of concepts and things. So when you start to look at AI, start small, start with trials, start with proof of concept, start thinking about the metrics and the things you want to measure on before you actually already start rolling out the project. And really try to keep it as short as possible, like a month is totally doable with, with a few people just to uh, experiment. And I really like the approach, with, which you also mentioned, Thomas, but probably we can talk more about it on the, on the panel where you basically say, well, this is just exploration. You use different ways to evaluate what happens in an exploration phase than in an actual business context. Um, start in-house, don't outsource it. Get maybe help to support yourself getting the stuff rolling, but you want to, try, you want to have all of this in-house. Even more, you want to have everyone involved in this in some way or another. And make it interdisciplinary. Like, don't have like a separate team of data scientists do this stuff. Try to have either still a separate team um, but then different kinds of disciplines together, or that can be step one, but then the, the, the kind of thing to work towards is try to spread this into the entire organization, like a matrix type organization. Um, AI transformation is like most bigger organizations are still stuck in digital transformation. That's totally fine. That's already a very, really, really hard process. Um, AI transformation is like, a, like step it up a notch. So before you even start thinking about AI transformation, um, really finish your digital transformation first. It will help a lot. Um, but it's better now than, than never. So it's an investment, stupid. Don't think that you know you will get your returns immediately. Like, you know, seven, seven years <laughs> can take, apparently. Um, then also, it's a tool. It, it's not that it will solve magically everything. Um, take a design-centered approach, which is an easy, quick way. You know, do a, a week-long design sprint. There's special tools nowadays, AI design sprints. So try to Google that out. Um, there's a lot of really interesting, you know, design sprint canvas and, and whatever, which you can just try to do in your organization. There's also uh, special consultancies just focused on that. There's one here at Hyper Island. They have an internal, um, I don't know what it is, but some consultancy at least who specifically does AI design sprints. Um, then, of course, follow the user, think outside the box, try crazy things. Like, interesting things happen in the margins, like in the things where you don't expect it. So don't try, try to make it, like, short, but also don't try to make it too constrained. Like, leave some space for, for exploration. Uh, and then also be transparent to everyone. Um, don't try to control it too much and make sure that then the learnings are also shared within the entire organization. So document everything. Um, then leaning maybe a bit up to the panel, some thought-provoking questions um, for which there's not really answers, but they're definitely like challenging. Um, what happens when we generate everything? That's like a tricky, tricky concept. When everything can be generated, you don't know what is real or not. Um, what happens when marketplaces consist out of AI creating things for other AIs? There's Bitcoin, it's very easy to create a virtual currency. Like you can have just a virtual currency with a virtual avatar and, a, and some AI agent um, and there is already marketplaces actually doing some of these. They're super rare where you can sell um, generated art, which is only digital. So it's almost like it just only goes in a, in a digital form. Um, so just adding kind of generative bots to the mix. Uh, similar, it's a bit similar, what is real. Open source versus profit. I mean, the example with Christie's, which has been sold as an example of that. Um, copyright IP is still very much a gray area. When um, a while back we had some projects we did where uh, I can't really tell for whom it was, but it was, a, it was a big project and the question was like, well, can we do this? And the answer of like many lawyers and, and months of research was, we don't know. It's like, it's a, it's a gray zone because imagine you have a, an, an AI model which is trained on a million songs and there's a thousand different individual copyright holders who owns what is being generated by that model. Is it the people who own the data? Is it half of that because there's work? So nobody really knows. Um, Ownership, similarly, when you have a model and it's open source, when you do different things with it, like who owns that, um, and of course jobs. So that's it. If you want to be updated on more of this stuff that is happening in the world, we have a newsletter, uh, and here you can also find me. So you, you, <coughs> you mentioned the dichotomy between augmentation and, and uh, 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 automation. Yeah. Automation. 
But you have an anthropology background. You know that technology and tools have always augmented uh, humanity in a way. So it's personally, is there really a difference between uh, automation and augmentation? Or is really AI always uh, focused on automating tasks uh, uh, in opposition to automating human um, like uh, empowerment or human participation in the creative process? Mm. I mean, it, it's, it's more about the frame you use to think about these things. So often when we talk about we can automate something, we don't think about like what are the things we lose by that. And I don't mean just people. I mean things like the examples of um, a lot of more automated systems are already running you know, in, in today's world for um, things like house prices, for pension, uh, recidivism rates if you go to court and you know, you're, you're, you're being, there, there's a special metric being used in the court system in the US where you, you know, will commit a crime again. That's fully automated for, by a black box AI system which can be like, it's con considered like company secrets, right? So you can't really challenge that. Um, and there, there's many, many of those examples where it all sounds really nice if you automate things, especially in the more, more soft areas. Um, but it means that you actually get, you tend to get more bias in these systems and even less transparency or ways of holding these systems accountable. Um, so that's why I, I think automation is, is a very yeah, tricky concept. Augmentation, I mean more about where I think things always should start, right? You should start, how can we make someone's life easier, right? This is a difficult thing. Can we not, why, why should we immediately go in the brakes into like the end goal? Can we automate it? No, why should we not say, oh, can we take one step at a time? And through that, we actually learn what are the kind of things that we, we didn't think about. Like there's always things that comes up that, that we learn through that process. So I think actually we can never automate anything. It's maybe a radical statement. But. Hello, um, how can I use AI to do go to less meetings? Is there like a tool that I can use that just automates like a response to people in meetings? I mean, there's, there's a story of a computer scientist who did exactly that, like um, remote meetings. And it was, it was kind of like an automated chatbot who would just write replies and do code commits on, on GitHub. Mm. And I think it took like half a year or so, nine months, something for people to figure it out. It was just literally not doing anything. Is there a way like I can automate my voice to like be in the room, but not really there? <laughs> Technically, yeah, sure, this is all possible. All right, cool, I'll look into that. <laughs> That's great. I'm winning the prize of ruining as many microphones as possible in one evening. But um, I would like to welcome, first of all, Thomas Beckham to come on the stage. And then we have three more people uh, that I'd like to introduce you to. Uh, so we have Robert Cipolin, who's uh, going to introduce himself as well when you come up. Do you have, is your microphone working? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Try again. Hello. No. Yes. yes. And uh, we have Mina Mustakalio, who is also coming up. Please test your microphone as yeah. well. OK. Yep. Yes. Working. And uh, Melanie Tesa, who's also coming up. So I would like, actually, you three, can you please just, because you haven't been on stage before, could you just introduce uh, yourselves and what you, what you do and what your focus is within AI today? Hello, my name is Melanie, and I'm the design director of our Berlin office at Futurist. And I look at AI from a very human-centered and design-centric perspective. <laughs> Um, on the one hand, um, how is AI applied in the design space for assisted creation or generative creation? But on the other hand, and I think that's more important, how can actually designer contribute to identify the right human and business problems and then apply um, together with other experts, data scientists, developers, whatever um, is important in order to decide if AI or machine learning is the right tool to solve these problems and how you can implement it. Okay, hey, um, I'm Minna Mostakalia. Um, I'm a head of product in a startup called Asset.ai. And um, my 
biggest interest is is ethics in AI and also especially now with the with the new startup it's it's about kind of how to how to build trust uh, with uh, by enabling transparency in, in algorithmic decision making so we are basically building a platform for that so and we believe that that's there that's at least an answer to to a lot of like um, future trust issues with with algorithmic decision making but uh, all in all um, I I kind of deal with several different kind of topics in, in, in AI ethics at the moment. Yeah, and no, I'm Robert, our resident data scientist here in Stockholm. Uh, what I've been now kind of focusing on for the past year or so is like how to improve productivity, uh, especially in, in, in an enterprise setting. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of potential of for productivity growth uh, with AI, and that's uh, something that I've been focusing on. Great, thank you. Uh, I actually, I actually want to ask with a, a question. Can I ask a question? I, I'm going to ask for my question. I actually have a, a question for you, uh, Rulof, and that is, you talk about creatives and AI, and you talk about working with creative agencies. It's kind of, you know. A lot of time, when it's like about which jobs are going to disappear first, which jobs are going to be, you know, are safe within AI and what all that means. A lot of the time, people are saying, "Oh, the creative industries is not going to affect them that much in the beginning." I mean, at least I've heard that quite a few times. People think they're safe because they're, you know, they're, they're creative. But I, th I wonder how is it normally when you when you mm. talk to creative agencies, is there some kind of resistance or do people generally accept like as you're saying you're actually making their jobs easier because one thing i was thinking of when you showed the thing with the pictures for social media i was thinking doesn't it just mean we can produce more of that i mean are you actually does it actually change my job or do i can i just more of do more of it yeah that i mean then again it's a tool so it depends how yes. you use it so of course you can use these kind of tools to, and that's why we always have people in the loop, so you can't like, there needs to be someone still in control of this system, so it's essentially a system you build up, but you can still use it to produce more crap, right? That, that's quite an easy in advertising, and that's definitely happening, right? People just churn out more ads, cheaper, um, can target them more, that's definitely like one use case. There's a long-term effect of that, however, which is probably you will crash your brand, like probably people will not be very happy with that. So you can do that kind of short term, that's like a valid strategy maybe, but quite soon brands find out that this is not the kind of, you know, customer centric approach they really want to take. Mm. Um, which is also, I mean, we're picky with the brands we work with, so maybe that's the experience we've had by that reason. O on the point about if people are kind of scared and, and if things can be mm. automated, there's a lot of non-creative work happening in creative industries. So True. sure, I mean, there we can, you know, automate the shit out of it, as people tend to say. Um, that's definitely So, yeah, that's definitely possible. Mm. I think that's the kind of work which is people don't enjoy, but people are still dependent on for their job, right? Especially junior designers, they go into an agency, they learn through, it's a bit like lawyers, they learn through the pain, um, and, and they still learn from it, and it's the usual way of going up. Um, it's how the industry is set up. I don't think it's, it's, it's a right system, however. Mm. So in the end, it's then a policy choice, like how do you use this system and how, how do you roll it out in your organization and what do you do when things change? Mm. To build on that, one typical thing designers do often is cropping images. And for example, um, Netflix, they use an algorithm in order to crop the images for different devices. So you have an image that's square and perfect for your computer screen. Mm and it uh, crops the image perfectly that you can use it on your phone, for example. So a lot of work, qu um, quantitative work in this case of cropping can be done faster and cheaper. And it's also not the stuff a lot of designers enjoy doing. It's just something they have to do. And when it's more about, um, or I think, uh, Airbnb is also using it from a sketch. They trade an algorithm in order to um, transfer the sketch really quickly into a clickable dummy, a click dummy, in order to test earlier. And this is also a transfer, a step you can make quicker and easier, but they never use it currently in order to make the high, full, complex, high fidelity solution that actually works. 
Well, I think that it also really comes back to what you were saying earlier, like that, you know, there's very often it's not the end result that is being mm. produced, but it's actually just give you, it could be just for idea generation. There was a lot of it that was, you know, giving different ideas. Mm. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the main thing there is, is like, gives ideas. Okay, this is not working very well. There you go. <laughs> All right. Yes, yeah, so I think the main thing there is that it, it it gives AI gives you ideas that you you wouldn't get from human. I think that's the most interesting mm. part of the whole thing is that you get something that that you wouldn't get from another human. Yeah, yeah. We always say AI, AI has bias, and that's the problem with AI. But so do people, mm. and it just means you have another bias or another very you know person with a big opinion in the room, which can mm. be good, right? <laughs> it's it's. Mm. And I think that that quite a different angle to this is that typically if we look at how markets behave, if you increase productivity like tenfold, of course it might crash the existing business, but it typically opens a completely new market that hasn't yeah. been able to access this, for example, the creative agencies beforehand. So if you can do and and, and I think those are also sort of counter forces for this kind of are we losing jobs or is the business going away? Because typically then we open up huge amount of new opportunities <laughs> at the same time. Next question. I mean, yeah, on, on, on that level, we see, so we have like mini agencies of like one or two people who do the work, which would kind of a classical agency would be with 30 mm. people, right? So that's a quite common scenario. I mean, even the neighborhood restaurant can have high quality creative work done for them because yeah. of the, yeah. the productivity and the, and the cost levels. And uh, so. I think the value of design can also be increased if you actually focus on the things that cannot uh, be easily automated yet. So the understanding, interacting, motivating humans in order to do something. And currently, we are humans are better at this. Um, this might change in the future. Let's see. Um, but currently, this also what um, Thomas mentioned in his talk, how do we actually design the inf interface to the human and understanding them and motivating them in order to either um, learn new habits or change their old habits or adapt things in order to c uh, create these solutions. We had a question over here. If at any point you want to ask a question, please just raise your hand and we'll come up. No, it's on. Hi. So during the presentation, uh, it was explained the, that there is a gap between the business and the hype of AI. So I guess you are uh, familiar with uh, AutoML, AutoKeras, and Google's Magenta. So those are, are tools that are making it easier for people to use AI without knowing AI. So it's uh, like closing that gap. Yeah. So for you, how, how, what is the time frame to close that gap? So from now to then, to closing that gap, how far can it be? Never. I mean, hype is hype, right? It will always be <laughs> new hype to follow. But it's true. Like, it's becoming easier and easier to, to, to use AI and, and do machine learning. And there's a lot of tools. And I think it's very important work that this is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, like, I think deep learning or these AI methods will be kind of commoditized and like every software engineer is going to be able to use them. And that's just going to be kind of the first part. Then like it'll be like every designer like clearly has be, ha will have like AI capabilities, something that like maybe four years ago or like even today you needed a PhD to work like to actually like produce results with it and like it'll just kind of trickle down and like everyone will be able to work with them and but i would also add that it's not just the, the algorithm side i think there's like on the technical side we need a lot of new tools for the the data part so how do we make the data easy because i think 60 80 90 percent of the yeah. time of typical ai or data science project is spent on on working with the data and then I think that the people refer that, that it's the one day that they can make the actual model and that, that is the fun part and the rest of the project is, is working and cleaning the, the, the actual data. But then I would say, th then one more thing going back to the, the, the gap between business and technology, I think that although how easy the tools are, it doesn't take away that you need a new mindset of looking the business through data and numbers. And I think that is something that, that is still sort of like something that we need to address. So if I can continue with the, the question. So 
AutoML is uh, an offering by Google, it's in their mm -hmm. cloud. AutoML allows you to load a lot of uh, images, for example, AutoML vision, and you can have the images uh, tagged and then it generates the model automatically. So you don't really have to know how it works. Uh, you just wait for the results and, and then uh, use it. Mm -hmm. So uh, this kind of tool effectively uh, democratizing the use of uh, ML. And my question was, so how far from now is it that people without a PhD can use uh, effectively uh, AI for their projects and their uh, creativity uh, solutions? Well, depending on the tasks, you can already do a lot. So mm. like AutoML and like uh, uh, different kinds of object detection stuff, and uh, that's already happening. Uh, then I think currently like what's more uh, challenging is to do like um, project, like in a way kind of like dynamic marketplaces or dynamic pricing, the stuff that like, for example, Uber does. That's very hard for a single person to start like working on. So, like, uh, how much should an Uber cost right now? And y that's something you need to integrate a lot of different data sources. Uh, so you can't do that quite yet. Maybe in like five years. But it, it, even then, like, I, d I don't want to put a hard number on it. I don't know. Uh, but certain stuff, like a lot of the computer vision stuff, you can do already now. Mm. So, like, I don't have a good answer for you, but like. It depends. Can I? Can there I was a question there in yeah. the back. Sorry. Do you yeah. want to? Do you want to build on it? Uh, I, I, I want to conclude because, like, through an example, like, like I think I might be repeating the same point again and again. But, but we've been running these kind of C level, board level tr AI trainings. And an example that the the one the, during the first course there was a CEO asking, "Can you give us an example of this?" And then the, our data scientist said, "Machine vision," and complete dead silence in the room. That is another example for CEO. That is an example for data scientist. But they were like probably looking if there was a uh, like construction company like asking whether we can use machine vision to actually predict the, the status of the, the site and so on. So and I think there is the gap that, that that business people can't imagine how they solve their real world problems, although the technologies are available. And that is a that is a huge issue. So no, sorry. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Hey. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, quick question. Uh, do you think AI could ever be offline and as effective as it's online? It, it is. So the models we run in, in all of our software, we have both an online mode and an offline mode. So a private mode. It's not as good. So with the user experience, we want people to have in the waiting times. It, it means that data has to go to our servers and then we have bigger models and, you know, we can scale it and it's quick. But it is possible nowadays to run, and there's some interesting experiments, the music experiments, running in your browser, generating music, playing with it, whatever. I, it's all possible. Like there is a, quite a breakthrough with um, WebGL, which is a technology in your browser, which stares GPUs. So it used to be that GPUs had to only, you know, be in like server centers. Now you can actually, I mean, big models will blow up your laptop, so your laptop will start making a lot of noise, but it's still on your laptop. Um, so it's definitely doable. Um, on mobile, it's a lot of companies doing it also, like um, Facebook, Apple. Apple has a lot of uh, what they call differential privacy. So they try to do the kind of, they have models, which they run on your, on your mobile. It's already trained. But the kind of really privacy-sensitive data you maybe don't want to send to anyone, it stays only on your mobile. Um, and it does kind of the, the prediction only purely on your mobile. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting, actually, from from kind of privacy point of view. Anyway, because it it works in really peculiar way when, when, when normally you kind of tend to do with sensitive attributes and also like you know a lot of personal data. You want to take something off or protect something, but in this case, which is really neat, is that they actually kind of scramble it. They they add noise into it. So when you when you try to get more information out of one person, it gets harder and harder all the time to, to yeah. kind of tie, and, and tie their strings. And anonymization is never really, it's, it's a kind of a safeguard. It's yeah. never like full proof, right? So the only real um, privacy is just, you know, <laughs> keeping the data at a particular place. Like that's the only real certain way. Oh, all right, thanks. We had a question here in the front. Microphone's coming. I don't know if mine's a question or not, but it's mostly uh, I would like to hear your opinion. Um, AI itself, like uh, um, for decision making, um, 
I see it very possible in areas that have constraint, for example, like you're talking about Netflix, it's cropping basically in things that, okay, it needs to go for that. But in areas that they, that where the where data can be actually uh, manipulated or um, or the source is actually moldable, in the case of the of um, the court system having a, a, a decision if the person is able to actually redo the crime uh, when actually a human is moldable in itself, something can actually affect generally their outcome or in the sense of a, of a, of a doctor, uh, the patient needs to actually tell what a, a, he's feeling or doing and he can actually be, be forget a little detail that can affect the whole decision. Uh, how is AI then a, a, like gonna be, let's say, um, a, like trustworthy? I guess this is something that I can, I can maybe start with. Um, let's say that, you know, using using AI and using, using uh, predictive algorithms in, in these kind of decisions where you, you give this kind of like, you rank, you give scores, for example, risk scores and stuff like that. And especially in these kind of sensitive areas like, like, um, uh, like courts or, or healthcare, or if, you, if you're talking about benefits or if somebody's getting a job or somebody is, is, is losing freedom, losing money, gaining advantage in, in let's say, insurance, in all of this, we th there are already cases where where we use or where where the industry uses algorithmic decision. It's not totally like I wouldn't say it's one hundred percent algorithmic decision making, but it's kind of um, algorithm mediated decision making, and it's extremely problematic. And there's at the moment there there for example, most of the people who are actually focusing on AI ethics are point blank saying that do not use, well, first of all, never use black box algorithms in these cases. And actually, if you go a bit further, just don't use algorithms at the moment mm. for this kind of decision making. It, we are not there yet. And there's too, at the moment, there's just too much risk of, of somebody getting like very, very mistreated. That and, and we are also in a situation where, where we, we don't kind of go go to the data and really make sure that what the data actually represents. And we use kind of impartial and biased data to, to, to these decisions, which humans obviously do too. But automating it makes it like, kind of it just adds so much kind of both speed and, and, and kind of uh, amplifies the whole thing that, 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 that shouldn't, shouldn't be going on now. In the future, there might be good cases for this and, and there might be a positive uses of alg algorithms for, for this kind of decision making. But at the, at the moment, it looks very much from the ex experiences that we are not there yet. We have some more over here. Hi there. Uh, first of all, thanks for your talks, both interesting talks on an interesting subject. Um, I want to apologize that this might, question might come across as a little bit negative, um, but the, um, the word ethics has been b banned around quite a lot tonight. And I just want to ask you about your opinion on um, quite a lot of people who may not be too well versed in the benefits of AI might be a little bit apprehensive in the fact that it might create this so-called useless class in where low-skilled jobs are taken over. And you mentioned in the past that automation has mainly created more jobs and that the, the problem has been averted by changing, uh, reskilling laborers and, and people like that. But I want to just get your opinion on whether you think this is a problem that we need to, to think about now and also whether the leaders in AI have an ethical obligation to find a solution for that problem of negating or losing people, their, their livelihood and jobs. I, th I think I, at least I can answer it like, I don't know whether this is exhaustive, but I think that, that, that one way that I would like to see is that we use AI for augmentation, people skills augmentation. So we upskill people to actually to, to various so not I don't think that in, in I think that it's more usable in augmenting people's sort of behavior and, and, and for example like there's a um, according to some discussions that I've been involved, for example, in machinery industry, there seems to be a problem that quite a lot of senior people, and same in insurance, insurance business, a lot of senior people are actually leaving the industry because of they're going on a pension. So then they have a huge issue. How do they upskill the junior people? And, and how do they bring up the speed? So, and I think there we can actually, and, and we've been even discussing, how do we capture the knowledge? How do we channel it to the more sort of junior people? How do we sort of help them to, 
to, to perform there. And I think that is an area that, that I feel that, that we should go after. But overall, I think that it's not just us, but it, I think it's everybody. I want to see a balanced society. I don't think that we want to have a polarized society where we have like no middle class. I think that my opinion is that middle class is the one that keeps the societies together. And how do we make sure that we have a healthy, balanced society in the future? And I think that's worth pursuing. But, but and I don't know who, who can make it happen alone. And I think everybody should go after it. Yeah, and the, I think the World Economic Forum came out with a report last month about they're trying to kind of predict by 2025 what's going to happen. And uh, th they came to the uh, conclusion that, like, yes, there's going to be more jobs created, and specifically in kind of analytics and handling data, and uh, then there are going to be destroyed. Uh, so I in the short term, it's looking kind of okay, just from purely from uh, uh, looking at like net job gains or losses. But then it's like th then there's a question about uh, well, who are the people who are losing their jobs? And are they, they going to be the same people that are getting new jobs? Maybe not. And then you need to kind of have that kind of societal discussion going on. Like, how are we going to uh, like help the people who lost their job? And it's the same thing, prob basically, that, uh, that's that been going on with kind of the free trade discussion or like, uh, uh, b like m maybe 10 or 15, 20 years ago. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a problem. Uh, and you need to start thinking about it now. Yeah, I, believe, mm. oh, I believe it's not only the AI leaders who mm. need to think about that. I think there are three levels. Each individual who is contribu contributing, no matter if you're a data scientist or designer, everyone who's involved in the creation process. Then you have the companies themselves who have to make decisions. But then there's also communities or governmental decisions. And I think only if these three parts play together, um, we can, because probably if only companies make decisions, they might not be beneficial for society. Hence, if only um, some governments make decisions, there might also be real differences in how they approach this topic. Yeah, very short, because it's maybe just a different viewpoint. Yeah, I think it will be a big problem. I think it's already a big problem. Um, I think we're overly optimistic, as we are when we're speculating about the future. Either we're always overly negative or overly optimistic because it's always vision driven and it's you know kind of our belief system driven it's not very objective so i think we're overly optimistic because the people who talk about this are generally the people who are you know like myself like leading the charge in building this ai system so of course we are optimistic because we won't lose our jobs um, the industrial revolution took around more than a hundred years so there was a lot of time to reskill laborers and it was also a quite uniform labor pool of particular kind of um, professions. The, the variety was not as diverse as it's right now. Um, there are kind of hopeful signs of people like educating and governments doing kind of, you know, education reforms for whoever wants to, but it will exclude like a large proportion of the population and it will exclude specifically mostly the people who are the most uh, negatively hit by this. Um, so there definitely will be a big underclass, like because it's not seen as, a, as enough of an urgency. There's universal basic income, UBI, which I think generally is a good idea. Like as such, like independent from like AI or, or not, yeah. it's not going to help either because having bread and, and you know having a little bit of at least food and a roof above your head doesn't make you less useless if you don't have anything else to do. Um, yeah, that's my <laughs> negative uh, other feedback. I yeah. would actually, sorry, sorry, Mina. I would actually, I'm think I'm just conscious of the time. Yeah. I'm just thinking, we had two questions here. I think you had another one there, so three. I, let's take these three questions and then let's uh, let's start to sum up. I don't know if, yeah, this person. You, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay, I have a comment or on the, um, you were talking about insurance, for example, the selection of the, the providing a prize or if you're accepted or not. I think, and I think the problem will be as it is today that the consumer uh, usually gets kind of the support, the help after the service provider provides mm -hmm. you. But in the perfect society, the consumer should have his AI system fighting with the supplier, the kind of insurance or the <laughs> bank, okay. the bank who yeah. didn't give you the loan. And you don't understand, why don't I get the loan? You don't, because you don't know the decision 
and, and that's the way it is today. You don't know how they decide and you get a no. So then you, as a consumer, you need to have your own AI system figure out how do I find yeah. kind of my loan. <laughs> so that's yeah. one yeah. comment. I think a balance is important, yeah. but I think the consumer has a tendency to lose. <laughs> what is really interesting in this whole discussion with, 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 with the algorithmic decision making and that is that obviously even now you, you know, we are going to require more transparency and more explainability from AI than we are now requiring from people, which is, I see as a good thing, <laughs> to be honest. Mm. So there's like positive things that this can also bring because we have, mm. we are, I think there's like so much criticism over this and, and, and there's like regulations coming where this, the, this kind of transparency is needed. And I agree that for, for in, in complicated cases, it might be that we need that like personal assistant who, who looks after us because these things are very complicated for, for any normal person, basically. Hey, I, I have a comment based on this, it's not actually a comment, it's a question to you if somebody has an idea, something that nobody started talking about, the sort of the challenges to the future, something that I've been thinking that I don't have an answer, is that if we look at system theory, and if we look at the current situation, we have roughly 4 billion more people coming to internet in the next like 10 years or something like that. We have more and more algorithmic decision making, we have these bots, we have more and more machine to machine sort of, uh, uh, sort of um, interfaces. What that means is that we have more and more people we have highly connected globe and it's really fast. What does system theory say about this kind of system? It becomes unpredictable. So the question is, like, if we look at social media at the moment, it is unpredictable, something just, but what if this actually spreads across the sort of the, the different areas, what happens? And, and if somebody has good ideas, like what would this mean? And, and we've been discussing somewhere that would it, should somebody put some slowness into the system somehow to make sure that we don't build a sort of unpredictable global system somehow. That's some thoughts for evening discussion. Humans, <laughs> humans are slow. Maybe we put those, your yeah. humans that you just <laughs> kind of said, <laughs> like in between. Did I kill the conversation? <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, it's too big a question. <laughs> Moika. Um, actually, that's a good uh, lead to my question because I come from a highly regulated industry where I see so much potential, but then we go with the GDPR and then the innovation starts. Um, do you see the GDPR is the one, of, one of the biggest challenges uh, from the legal perspective or is there something else? And how, do you th first and foremost, do you think it's a good thing? do you see it as a challenge? And how do you challenge it? Because as you also stated, we've got different uh, countries, we've got different governments having different approaches to date and date the management. So how do we challenge that we can actually utilize the data in the name of greater good? You can say that. How do you, view, how do you view GDPR in general? <laughs> okay, I, I, I start maybe. Um, well, I personally see it as a good thing. It really depends also like how much we kind of, t kind of, or how, how, how we interpret it because GDPR is not this kind of like very literal law. It's, 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 it's full of recommendations. So it remains to be seen how exactly it will be interpreted. Plus it's not the end, it's just the beginning. There's going to be much more regulations coming about like all kinds of like uh, usage of data and, and, and data privacy. What will have a big if impact is like how we, how personal data will be um, governed in the future. There are like few models out. Um, it's, I hope it's not going to be the same than nowadays that Google and Facebook and Amazon own everything. But there's like quite a lot of movements going on about like either owning or giving uh, permissions to your own data. And if, if people can feel like legitimately that they have control on their own data and, and, and kind of like who they give access to their own data or give it away or take it away, I think that most probably will create quite fruitful environment in, in, in using that data as well. But if it gets to this kind of like totally like nobody trusts where that their data is safe or used safely or used in a proper way and they have no idea where it is. I, I think that's not very good foundation for any kind of business. And to build on this, it's also that these limitations um, 
are can be used as a source to find more creative solutions to mm. solve uh, the problems. Take not the easy way where you might exploit uh, some uh, some people or privacy or other issues, but find more creative ways in order to mm. solve the problem. And I think it's also not set in stone. It will change over time. It needs to adapt. And um, on the one hand, it's uh, like very good to have it, I believe, with my very Western culture, I would say. Um, some people say it's negative because it slows down innovation for us versus other maybe countries where they don't have the regulation. But in the end, it's uh, it's meant to benefit us as the human. And at the end, it should be our problems that we solve and not do something only for pure business benefit, but reconsider what does it mean for people and for society. That sounds like a very good statement to end on, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's too great a good for society. I would actually like to really thank you all for being here today, mm. and I would like to thank all of you for coming and for a great discussion here. Uh, that discussion we can of course continue just reach out to us or you know we we are obviously available on lots of social media that is kind of destroying our lives but yes we are available on lots of places i'd also really love uh for you to give us feedback we really like feedback so any feedback is really appreciated do you think this was the right kind of context is it the right topics we we covered what about the location i don't know whatever uh, it, the microphones, we know that didn't all of them work, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. It was something with my <laughs> energy, I don't know. But uh, generally, uh, this was a really, really great discussion. And uh, let's, let's continue and uh, we'll see what we're going to be talking about in a year. Probably lots of things have changed. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming.